This week's edition of New England Authors, we dig into our history by visiting standard New England towns and examining historic houses which every resident should visit. Fasten your seatbelts. Our guide is Beth Louie. Our author today has had two major writing careers. First, as an academic writer and editor who founded and directed the scholarly publishing program at Arizona State University. Her books include Expanding the American Mind, Books and the Popularization of Knowledge, also Handbook for Authors, and now it's in its fifth edition, and Revising Your Dissertation. She has held posts and awards too numerous to name here. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Beth Louie, uh, you're a credit to our community because you have dug into the history of, our, uh, of uh, New England and, and made, it, uh, made it come alive. So your second career, now which we're going to talk about, is um, uh, exploring this history via homes and towns. And she published three major books, which, uh, which are here. And the first book um, is Home Stories, which um, I, I hope we're going to talk about all of them. But this was your first book, right? right? Yes, it was. Yeah. So um, uh, tell us how it originated, where it came right. from, and so on. Well, in 2006, my husband and I moved into a house in Fairhaven that turned out to have a Me Too story uh, that involved the owner the Reverend Isaiah Weston, and a 14-year-old servant in his house. And by going to the uh, archives at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, um, I was able to find out more about both people, both the, the servant and uh, the reverend. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went on to um, look at some of the other houses in Fairhaven with great stories. Yeah, so you, you moved into Fairhaven just mm -hmm. uh, and then you recognize that there, there was a history there. There was a, 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 a little, it was very different from Arizona. Oh, very. And yeah. it, it was no secret. The town calls itself the small town with a big history. Right. And our tourism director leads walking tours. And that's how I found out about some of the other houses. And I think you mentioned that um, they have a large historical society for a small town. <laughs> we, we have archives. We have a historical society. We have a historical museum and a lot of um, buildings on the National Register. Right. Which is one of the other stories, because most of them were built by a man named Henry Huddleston Rogers. Right, we're gonna talk yeah. about him in just a second, <laughs> but, but um, first I, I want to talk about the, the houses themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not talking about the construction of the houses. You're not talking about how they're framed and the, and no. the roofs and stuff. No. You're talking about you're using the houses to talk about the history, who lived there and right. why. And yeah, why. the stories that happened in them. So what was the, uh, the, the house? You want to start with your house? You well, wanna... beyond the, the actual events, which yeah. were pretty dramatic, I was really interested in how the town reacted. They took her accusation seriously. Yeah. They tried to figure out. They weren't so much concerned with what was the truth as with reconciliation. They wanted uh -huh. everyone to uh -huh. feel that they had been treated fairly. Yes. And they failed. But they really, really tried. Uh, and and I and T tell us the whole story. Tell us the 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 gritty details. The, oh of well. It. Yeah. Well here's what Phoebe Jenny said in, roughly in her words that Phoebe Jenny was the she was the fourteen year old servant. And yeah. um, she said that one night when Mrs. Weston was away visiting the sick uh, Mr. Weston came into the chamber that she shared with his two young sons with no clothes on. And he got into bed with her and one of her sons, offered to lift her linen and put into her hand an indecent thing. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's how they talked in the, in oh, yeah, the, in the good well, old days. Well, and this right. is what she's telling all the church fathers. And um, then he asked how old she was. She said 14, and he left her room. So... <laughs> well, I was, um, I, I just want to jump a little bit ahead. I was very surprised. Uh, Fairhaven is uh, just an uh, ordinary New England town, mm -hmm. or uh, good old, uh, it, it could be anywhere. It could right. be in Vermont, it could be anywhere. 
uh, except it happens to be on the coast. And as you said, it shares, uh, it shares a port with uh, 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 New Bedford. So um, uh, I was surprised to find that New England, not Texas, not Saudi Arabia, <laughs> began the oil business That's right. in the 1860s. Well, so, in, in 1851, oil was discovered in Pennsylvania, in Titusville. Uh -huh. And the people who had made money from oil in Fairhaven and New Bedford had made it from whale oil. But one young man um, heard about what was going on in Titusville and decided he would cast his lot with petroleum. And he yeah. moved there. And he eventually became a, a, a principal in the Standard Oil Trust. And he's still among the 100 wealthiest Americans of all time, really? toward the top of the list. Uh, uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. and he um, was the town's benefactor. Right, right. Is this uh, Henry Rogers? That's Henry Rogers. All right. Yeah. yeah uh, so, um, uh, tell us the story. So, 1851, they used oil uh, for mostly lighting, or what? Lighting, lubrication. Oh, uh, lubrication. Yeah, it, it wasn't yet being used for, 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 for engines. Steam engines or anything not, like not, that? Not, not yet. yet no. uh, uh, but it was very close to that. Yeah. Yeah, it was very close to that. Okay, so Henry Rogers, one of the, one of the, uh, you have you you spend a lot of time talking about uh, about Henry Rogers well, in your book. So we, yeah, we live yeah. in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> oh, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, but a different he, Mr. Rogers yes. than we know. Yes, yes, okay. and a very different temperament. He was a ferocious competitor and right. gambler. He uh, he came from poverty. No. Yeah, well, not um, not, not abject poverty, poverty, but, poverty, but, but you know yeah. ordinary circumstances. He went to high school and then went to work, um, and. He married a local woman, yeah. and he was, although he lived in New York most of the time, he was very fond of Fairhaven, and he built um, a high school, which looks like a palace. Um, he built the town hall. He built the library. When you say he built with his he, money. With his money, yes. Yeah. Charles Brigham, the architect. Which he made in oil. In oil. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, but not just oil. Once yeah. he made money from oil, he went into railroads and yeah, copper, right. anything he, that could monop be a monopoly. He competed with uh, Rockefeller. He was. He worked with Rockefeller. Oh, he worked with Rockefeller. Yeah, Ro right. Rockefeller yeah. was standard oil. He even yeah. owned the Staten Island Ferry. Oh yes. <laughs> uh -huh. And he won. He was tired of the Staten Island Ferry being too slow, so he raced it with his steam yacht, uh -huh. and the yacht won. <laughs> right. So he, he lived in Fairhaven. He was a, a very big uh, part of, of that of that community. Oh yes, he yeah. he lived there yeah. in the summers. He built an eighty-five room mansion. Okay. Um, and um, he he built a park. He built the public buildings that are now on the National Register. So he was a good rich person. For uh, Fairhaven, yes, and in many other Fairhaven. ways. He yeah. he supported Booker T. Washington. He paid Helen Keller's college tuition. He was philanthropic, but you didn't want to cross him. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's one of those kind of people. Yeah. So I, I want to turn to someone else. You, you mentioned, so you have all these stories about yeah. different people and, and the houses they lived in, and they're all within walking distance, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so the next person is Man, Man, Manhiro. Manjiro. Manjuro, Manjuro, Manjuro uh, yes. Nakahama, mm -hmm. right? And he he was uh, stranded on a desert island with a couple other people, right? Yes, yeah. he, he's um, a teenage boy in, from Japan, is a fisherman, and he and um, four other men were stranded on an island for six months yeah. with no fresh water, nothing, you know, just rainwater and turtle eggs, and they were rescued by a whaling captain from Fairhaven mm -hmm. named Captain Whitfield. And um, Manjaro was extremely intelligent. Mm -hmm. And he quickly learned English. He was learning about navigation. And when they went to the Sandwich Islands, um, the rest of the men from the island wanted to stay there and eventually go back to Japan. But Manjaro wanted to go to the United States with Captain Whitfield, and yeah. he did. And he became the first Japanese person to live in America. Uh, and, very, uh, very interesting story. Uh, you're listening to New England Authors. Thank you.
case you're joining us, we're, we're talking with Beth Louie, and we're talking about New England history, and she's written three uh, marvelous <coughs> books featuring people's houses, but really also featuring uh, the, uh, the history of, of the people themselves. Um, so how did, he, uh, how did um, uh, Mr. Nakahama end up uh, in Fairhaven, and he grew up there, and is, well, he, he is lived married, and so on? No, he no. He, um, he came with Captain Whitfield, and he stayed three years. Uh, but he was he was 13 and yeah. he was homesick he wanted to go back to japan which was very difficult then if you left japan and lived elsewhere japanese law forbade you to return really uh -huh. so when he did eventually get back to japan he was interrogated for months and months to make sure that he was still a loyal wow. uh, wow. member of society yeah and then when the west arrived in the form of admiral perry um, Manjaro was the only person in Japan who spoke English, the only one who'd been to the United States. Mm -hmm. So he became um, the person who could deal with Westerners. Oh, I see. And eventually, although he wasn't totally trusted ever, yeah. um, he became a national hero. And every Japanese schoolchild knows the story. We get lots of Japanese tourists. Oh, really? And when the house where he lived in Fairhaven was falling down, a Japanese doctor um, bought it, raised a million dollars to renovate it as a museum, and then donated it to the town. Excellent. What a wonderful yes. uh, thing. So, you know, you, you, you have so many of these stories, <laughs> we can't really go into them all. No. But um, you must have did an enormous amount of research. And how did you do that? Uh, okay, uh. I, 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 get you, <laughs> I guess there were the archives, but you must have uh, looked into a lot of microfiche, uh, old newspapers. What did you do? Newspapers are extremely useful. Yeah. But the main thing is the archival collections that um, provide the the diaries, the correspondence, the um, sometimes photographs, once photographs were invented. Um, the most fun for me is just sitting there and reading people's letters. I mean, um. that's not something polite people are supposed to do, but um, they're all dead and they left them behind, so it, it's kosher. <laughs> and yeah. it's, and you, that's how you learn what was going on. <laughs> I hope people Be careful what you say. Like yeah. But now we now we have uh, we have everything is uh, text messages which keep kind of forever, right? You don't If you're uh, not careful they do, yes. Yeah, if you're not careful they do. So uh, and and then what did you find about New England people way back then? Are they, were they in the 1800s? A lot of this focuses on, on people in the 1800s, mm -hmm. all, all three of your books. Um, are they different than today? Well, not really. I mean, what I, every time I tried to figure out why one person did one thing and another person did another, what it came down to is that people are complicated. They were complicated then, they're complicated now. And to figure out what happened is not that hard, but why it happened is a lot trickier. Yeah. People, um, they were they were different in many ways. They were generally more religious. Yes, yes, um, yes. They were um, much more class conscious. Um, not that we aren't, but they were even more so. Uh, and they, uh, but when you look at families, they weren't that different. They got along or they didn't get along. Um, <clears throat> they had good friends or some of them were less good at making friends they were just as complicated as we are and, and you bring up the uncomfortable subject of slavery as well yes uh, which uh, some people didn't like to use that word they like to use servant instead right. of slaves but yeah. there were yeah. slaves in New England uh -huh. um, and um, one of my very favorite stories is in this book um, it's about the Colonel John Ashley house but Colonel John Ashley was not the important person Colonel John Ashley's slave, whom he called Mumbet, was the important person. Right. Because she sued successfully for her freedom in 1781, and her uh, successful trial was essentially the end of slavery in Massachusetts. Right. There wasn't an official pronouncement that slavery ended, but there was this trial, and that was the end of it. Well. Right? The 1780 Massachusetts Constitution ended slavery in fact, I mean, in, in law. In fact, it took a bit longer. Um, but certainly her 
her case. And, and what I loved about that was the minute she won her case, she changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman. Elizabeth Freeman, yes, yes. Freeman, yes. yes. So th tell us a little bit more about her, because I, I, I wanted to, to, uh, to talk about that. So t uh, wh okay. what, what's her uh, background? She was born a slave. Her parents were slaves. And um, what, what, what town was this again? She, she was born in Claverack, New York. Uh -huh. And her, um, the daughter of that household inherited her from yeah. her father. And they lived in Ashley Falls, which is a village of Sheffield in right. western Massachusetts. Right. And um, when she was in her 30s, she was living in a house with a man who was very politically active, um, very much in favor of the revolution. And he would host meetings of men who would talk about the rights of man and everyone having a right to freedom and happiness. And Mumbet was illiterate, but she was very smart. And she heard what they were saying. And she said, I'm not a poor, dumb critter. Mm -hmm. Can't I, too, have my freedom? And she was determined enough to get it. She was yeah. a very talented healer and herbalist and midwife, very well respected in the community and had a long and happy life. We're, uh, uh, this is uh, New England Authors. We'll be right back. We're talking with uh, Beth Louie. Uh, she's written uh, three marvelous books. And uh, on the last time, you jumped to your other books. Right. Yeah. And um, they're, they're about historic houses in um, uh, eastern Massachusetts and western Massachusetts, one of, one of each, right? Right. And uh, um, why did you choose the houses that you did? We know there's a lot of historical houses. Yes. You didn't choose, for example, the Hawthorne House. No, right. that's the next book. That's, right. <laughs> that's the next book. Okay. Yeah, um, I had uh, a word. Initially, these two books were supposed to be one book, yeah. but it would have been too long, so uh, we divided it up. Right. The houses had to be open to the public, uh -huh. which was not true of the Fairhaven houses. Yeah. So they had to be open to the public, and that was the and distributed across the state. Those were the publishers' rules. My rule was that it had to have a story that kind of gripped me. I, it had to be a good enough story that I was willing to spend months reading about it and writing about it. Um, and I wanted to have women's stories, African-American stories, stories of ordinary people as well as famous people. Um, and so I hope I got a good mixture. Yeah, well, speaking of famous people, we go down to Quincy, Massachusetts <laughs> for uh, two presidents, right? Yes. Yeah, um, uh, and there are actually there are several houses down in that area, right? right? There yeah. are three. There are three houses. They're all part of the Adams National Historical Park. And after I retired and moved here, I worked at the Adams Papers at the Mass Historical Society mm. um, on the diaries and uh, autobiographical writings of Louisa Catherine Adams, Mrs. John Quincy. So um, I was aware of the houses and the stories before I started. This was before people had presidential libraries, right? <laughs> yes. Right, <laughs> yes. right. Yeah. Um, but the Adams family saved all their papers, and they're all at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and they've, they've been edited. A lot of them have been published. Um, a lot of them are online. All the published volumes have been digitized, and you can read them online. They're indexed, so they're very easy to use for research. And um, what I was really interested in was kind of the the subtexts, the, the, the shorter stories that don't always get into the tours. Um, there's a wonderful story about John Quincy and his wife who um, John Quincy had advised his parents to put some of their money in a British bank and the bank failed. He felt guilty and he felt he was honor bound to restore their money. Yeah. So he had to sell his house in Boston and buy one of, buy his birthplace, which is a little salt box. And Louisa came from a very wealthy um, family in London. She had lived in Berlin and in Nantes. And all of a sudden, they had to move into this little bitty salt box. Yeah. And she said, you know, she recognized that it was a, a debt of honor and that it was the right thing to do. Um, but then her fancy friends from Maryland came to visit, and she was mortified 
the rooms were so small, there wasn't room for all her friends. Yeah. And she said, they knew what I was accustomed to. Yeah. So uh, John and his son, John Quincy, were very mm -hmm. different people, right? They yes. Were, uh, yes. Entirely different presidency. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, it's a very interesting place to visit. That, oh, that yes. whole park really, really, if you're interested in American history, go down to that, uh, those, that area in Quincy. Yes. So um, in, their, in their second book here, you started talking about um, John Ashley, the John Ashley mm -hmm. House in Sheffield, and you introduce Elizabeth Friedman. Okay, mm -hmm. we talked about that. And then you go to um, uh, Samuel Harrison House in mm -hmm. Pittsfield. Yes. Way, way down at the other end of, um, uh, so who way was this north. Reverend Harrison? He was um, a minister in Pittsfield who became the chaplain of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. And he wasn't the chaplain for very long because he got malaria and he got sent home. But the reason he's important is that he became sort of the poster child for equal pay for black soldiers. Uh, when black soldiers were recruited for the 54th Massachusetts and other regiments, they were told they would be paid as much as white soldiers. But this was, this this was, was the, the Civil, Civil War. War. Yeah, this right. was, yeah. But then when they started fighting and started getting paid, they were being paid half as much as white soldiers, and they were having to pay for their uniforms. Yeah. And um, when the soldiers discovered that, uh, they refused to take any pay. They continued to fight, but they refused to take any pay. And Governor Andrew of Massachusetts got the Massachusetts legislature to make up the difference but the soldiers refused. They would not take anything but what they were due. And um, eventually, Frederick Douglass even spoke to uh -huh. Abraham Lincoln about it. Yeah. And Lincoln said he thought it was a reasonable compromise because some people didn't think black soldiers should be allowed to fight at all. Mm. Um, and eventually, Congress and the president agreed that the soldiers should be paid the same amount. They were, it was paid retroactively. Um, but Harrison was used um, by the people who were arguing for equal pay as the example of someone who had suffered from this unfair policy. So the, the uh, 54th Res Regiment fought very bravely yes. and, and suffered uh, tremendous losses. They did. Uh, very, very famous in this. Yeah. So um, any other houses you'd like to uh, bring to our attention that we should visit? By the way, you can get these books and, and go visit the houses uh, right. with, uh, with um, kind of a backstory that you won't get in uh, reading the, the sheets of paper that you find <laughs> at the house. Well, I think the most beautiful house is Beauport, which is in Gloucester. Uh, it's 43 rooms of a house designed by um, one of America's first interior designers, and it's absolutely fabulous. Um, another uh, really fun house is on the Cape, uh, the Edward Gorey House. Um, uh, he's my most most modern person. Where, where, where on the Cape is that? It's is in, um, oh, um, it will come to me in a minute. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, uh, so, Strawberry so, Lane so, in uh, Yarmouthport. In Yarmouthport. So, uh, what was what's interesting about that place? Well, Edward Gorey uh, is the artist who you, you may know from um, Mystery on PBS. Um, he wrote and illustrated um, somewhat creepy books. Um, and he was also the des set designer and costume designer for the Broadway production of Dracula. Uh, and he collected things, rocks and frogs and elephants. And the house is full of his collections. And each year they do a different exhibit of his work, um, the little books he published on his own um, and his other some, sometimes his childhood letters. It's just a wonderful little house to visit. It's, it's uh, a very lively kind of museum. So uh, you, you said that you've got to come out with a, another uh, book. I don't want to tell, I don't want to give away and <laughs> oh, say I'm wh happy which houses, to. which well, houses you're going to, you're going to visit. Well, the Are next you going to go to um, New Hampshire? Yes, Vermont, absolutely. You know? Yeah. I'm going to get out of Massachusetts. Massachusetts uh. will still be there, but it'll be about New England authors from Connecticut 
all oh, the way up to Maine. Oh, that's the name of the show. That's we right. We definitely have to have you back on to talk <laughs> right. about uh, New England yeah. authors. Because yeah. Connecticut also, has a bunch. that's why you're going to talk about Hawthorne. And, and, um, right, because yeah, he got left out. Hawthorne and Emerson and Thoreau got left out of the Eastern book because I had Louisa May Alcott in Concord. Oh, yes, you talked about right. the Alcott House. That's another, uh, yeah. another very interesting uh, chapter in your yeah, book. Yeah, so that one will, will cover, um, I'm hoping, even Dr. Seuss whose house is in Massachusetts, but there's Mark Twain, um, oh, Harriet Beecher in, in uh, Connecticut. In Connecticut, Harriet yes, Beecher and across, Stowe, uh, across yeah. the road from Harriet Beecher Stowe, right? Right, and um, um, there's Noah Webster. Oh, yes, I visited. In, in yes, Hartford, yes, uh, right. Noah Webster. And uh, uh -huh. Eugene O'Neill in uh, New London. Yeah, excellent. A lot of personalities. Yes, yeah, so yeah. starting in the east and moving west. Well, I think it's a really wonderful idea. The books are really interesting. Uh, you get a, 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 a good history, a good personal history of what uh, daily life was like in, in New England. Thank you so much for, for presenting to us and for being on our show. Uh, this is uh, New England Authors. We record here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We broadcast on stations throughout the regions. You can uh, watch episodes you miss on YouTube. And remember, watch locally. Mm -hmm.